How do you lower the pH of your soil? That's what we're going to investigate today. I'm going to discuss several methods that are popularly recommended online. Some work and some don't work. We'll sort through that mess. And then I'll give you some advice about buying the products that actually work and how to use them. Now in this video, I'm not going to worry about why you're lowering pH. I'm not going to discuss the kind of plants that need lower acidity. That's a topic for another video. I'm going to assume you've done your homework, you know you want to lower the pH, and now you're looking for a solution. But before we go on, I have to give you one piece of advice. Changing soil pH is difficult and it's not long lasting. Once you lower the pH, you're going to have to keep doing something to that soil to keep the pH low. It's not a one-time fix. So if at all possible, grow plants that grow in the soil you have and don't try to change pH. But okay, you want a lower pH? Let's figure out how. Here's a list of the options I'm going to have a look at. Compost, coffee grounds, pine needles, oak leaves, heat moss, several chemicals, and also fertilizer. All of these suggestions are reported to add acid to your soil. It's the acid that will acidify the soil. And that's true, but I want you to consider something. When rain comes through the sky, it picks up CO2. Water and CO2 form carbonic acid. When that rain hits the ground, it has a pH of around 5.5. That's fairly acidic. It has been raining for millions of years, and your soil is still alkaline. Or perhaps the pH is a little under 7, but you want it lower for the plants you're trying to grow. So this acid rain that has been falling forever is not getting the pH low enough. What that means is that we have to add a fair amount of acid, more than rain, to accomplish the job. Now let's look at some of the claims for doing this. The first one is compost, and this is recommended by a lot of people. Now if we look at finished compost, the pH of that is around neutral, pH of 7, or slightly higher. A lot of compost is around the 7.4 mark, so it's not acidic. I don't understand why people think that we can add compost to soil and drop the pH. It's not an acidic material. When you add compost to soil, it's adding organic matter. Organic matter buffers pH. What that means is it prevents the pH from changing very much. So if we add compost to soil and it's alkaline, the soil is going to tend to stay alkaline even if we treat it with acids. That buffering capability keeps the pH where it is. It doesn't make the soil very acidic. Compost is not going to work. How about coffee grounds? For some reason, a lot of people think coffee grounds are very acidic, but they're really not. Now, depending on what kind of beans you're using and how the coffee's brewed, there is a variation. But most coffee grounds have a pH that's very slightly acidic. 6.5 to 6.8 is a very common range. So they're very slightly acidic which means they're going to have virtually no effect on the pH of soil. Coffee grounds just aren't going to work for you. Pine needles. I see this one all the time. Pine needles are acidic. Collect them from the pine forest, bring them home, put them in your soil or use them as mulch, and the pH drops. For some reason, people think that pine trees make the soil where they're growing acidic. And that's not what happens. Pine trees like to grow in acidic soil, so you find more of them if the soil is acidic, but they grow just fine in alkaline soil too. I mean, my pH is 7.4, and we have pines growing here. They self-seed all the time. The soil underneath them stays at 7.4, and in fact, scientific studies have shown that even 50 years later, that pH hasn't changed. Pine needles are slightly acidic when they're green and on the tree. By the time they get brown and fall off, they're no longer acidic. They do not acidify soil. Oak leaves, again, same claim as pine needles. Same story. Oak leaves are slightly acidic when they're on the tree, but by the time you collect them, they're not acidic. So you're not adding any kind of acid to your soil. They have no effect on the pH of soil. They don't work. How about peat moss? Well, peat moss 
is at least acidic. It has a pH of about 5.5. So it makes sense that if I add this to soil, it will lower the pH of that soil. And that's actually true. It does that. The question we have to ask is, how long does that lower pH last? A number of years ago, I went looking for an answer to that question, and I couldn't find it anywhere. So I did my own study. Now, this isn't very scientific, but I did do several samples and a control. And the results are pretty clear. Here are the results. I mixed peat moss with my soil. At the time, the pH of my soil measured at 7.7. .7. And I mixed peat moss and soil in various amounts. So I had a pot with just peat moss and no soil. And I had a pot with soil and no peat moss. And then I had three pots in between these with 25, 50, and 75% peat moss. Then I measured the pH of that soil over a period of time. So you can see at the start of the experiment, the pH did drop. And the more peat moss that was added, the lower the pH, which is exactly what we'd expect. The problem is that even after one day, the pH of all the pots that had soil in them was up over seven. So the acidifying effect of peat moss lasted less than a day. Lots of people swear by peat moss. And if you add huge amounts to soil, you will get a slight drop in pH for a certain period of time. But as you've seen, after nine days, the pH is back up to where it was. That's not much good for growing plants that need a low pH. So peat moss is a very poor choice for trying to lower the pH of your soil. Now let's look at some chemicals that are commonly recommended. The first one I'd like to look at is sulfur. When sulfur is put into soil, the microbes come along and they change the sulfur into a compound called sulfate. Sulfate is the main ingredient in sulfuric acid. It's an acid. When that's added to soil, it does lower the pH of soil. An important point here is that this reaction is not a chemical reaction. It's a biological reaction. It requires the microbes to carry it out. If I take a pot of sterile soil and I put sulfur in it, the pH won't drop. Sterile soil has no microbes. So the sulfur stays as sulfur and it has no effect on pH. Now that won't happen in your garden or in potted plants because all that soil has microbes in it. But as we'll see later, the fact that microbes are doing the action is important in this discussion. There's another compound that's recommended a lot, and that is aluminum sulfate. Notice that part of the name is sulfate. That's the same sulfate that's created with sulfur. Sulfate is an acid, and it does lower pH. Aluminum sulfate will lower the pH of your soil. Because the sulfur does not have to be converted to sulfate, aluminum sulfate is actually much faster than using sulfur. Your pH will drop almost instantly, within a day or two. But there's some downsides to using aluminum sulfate. First of all, it's much more expensive than sulfur. The second problem is that aluminum is a metallic ion. We don't want those kind of heavy metals in our soil. They're toxic. Too much aluminum is toxic to us, and there have been reports that aluminum might be causing diseases in humans. We do know that too much aluminum is toxic to plants. So you can use a little bit of aluminum sulfate and drop the pH a little bit. But if you need a whole bunch of it to drop the pH farther, you can add so much aluminum that you're making the soil toxic to plants. Another reason you shouldn't use aluminum sulfate is that it's less effective than straight sulfur. Because it's got the aluminum component in there, you have to add about five times as much aluminum sulfate as sulfur. It doesn't make it very effective. Stay away from aluminum sulfate. If for no other reason, because of its toxicity in soil. Now, because of that toxicity, some people have come along and said, well, why don't we use iron sulfate? Again, you'll recognize the sulfate part. That is the acid part. Iron sulfate will lower the pH of your soil. It is also fast acting. It's already in the sulfate format. So as soon as you put it on your soil, pH starts dropping much faster than using sulfur. But again, we have the same kind of downfall. 
Iron is not as toxic to plants or humans, so that's not as big of an issue. But it's less effective, and you're going to have to add five times as much as sulfur. And it's more expensive. For those reasons, iron sulfate is not really a good choice, but it does work. How about fertilizer? How do fertilizers affect the pH of soil? And can they be used to lower the pH? Well, the answer is maybe. It depends on the fertilizer. Now, some fertilizers have ingredients like ammonium sulfate, calcium sulfate, potassium sulfate is very common in fertilizer. And let's not forget magnesium sulfate, which is Epsom salt. And if a fertilizer is adding magnesium, then it probably is in the form of magnesium sulfate. Again, you'll recognize all of these as nutrients plants need, but they're in a sulfate format. The sulfate will acidify the soil. So if you buy fertilizer with a lot of sulfate compounds in it, it will lower pH. The other main ingredient in fertilizer is nitrogen. And this is kind of an interesting nutrient. Fertilizers have nitrogen in three common formats, uh, nitrate, ammonium, and urea. And you can tell which one they have by looking at the label. Personally, all fertilizers should have this clearly marked right on the front of the bottle. But most products tend to hide it because they think, oh, gardeners don't really care. But you should care. Look at the label on the back and it will tell you which of these it has. Nitrate, ammonium, or urea. And it's important if you're working with pH. When we add nitrate, it actually increases the pH or has no effect at all. If we add ammonium, ammonium actually lowers the pH of the soil. So if you're trying to get a lower pH, you want your soil more acidic, then pick a fertilizer that has ammonium in it and not nitrate. In fact, a really good ingredient is ammonium sulfate. The ammonium lowers pH and the sulfate lowers pH and together they're more effective than the two separate. What about urea? It's an inexpensive form of nitrogen and so you do find it in a lot of fertilizers. Well, urea doesn't stay as urea in soil. Microbes come along and convert it to ammonium. Since ammonium lowers the pH, so will urea. So urea is also a good choice in your fertilizer if you're trying to lower pH. If you don't care about the pH, urea is still a good choice because it's a pretty inexpensive form of nitrogen. Now the advantage of picking a fertilizer with ammonium and sulfate in it is that these are released very quickly into soil. They lower the pH of soil almost instantly. A very fast reaction. It's a chemical reaction. They don't have to wait for microbes to come along and make those changes. So pick the right fertilizer and it will lower your pH. The problem you have with fertilizer is that you can only add so much. You might need to drop your pH this much, but if you add this much fertilizer, it's toxic to plants. You know that if you add too much nitrogen to your soil, you'll burn your plants, you'll kill your plants. So with fertilizer, you can only add a certain amount and that only lowers the pH a certain amount. It's not a good way to lower it a long way. So what is the solution? The solution is to use the right kind of fertilizer and at the same time use sulfur. Use the two together. Sulfur is the main ingredient you're going to use to lower pH, but whenever you fertilize, you're going to use the right kind of fertilizer to keep it lower or lower it a little bit more. That's the real solution. Now let's have a look at sulfur a little closer. When do you apply it? What form of sulfur should you use? How much should you use? Those are all important questions. It's no good just buying some stuff and spreading around and hoping the pH will be where you want it. It's not that simple. Let's go back to something I discussed a couple minutes ago. Sulfur has to be converted to sulfate. And that's a biological reaction. Microbes have to carry out that reaction for you. Now, the first important point is that that's a slow process. If you put sulfur on today and you've got lots of microbes there, the pH is not going to drop quickly. It takes months, anywhere from six months to a year, for that pH to drop. It's a slow process. I see a lot of advice online that goes something like this. Apply the sulfur in the fall. Let it sit there all winter, and then in spring when you're ready to plant, 
the pH would be lower. You've given those microbes a chance to convert the sulfur to sulfate. Sounds reasonable, except for one thing. These microbes aren't active in the wintertime. They're only active once the soil temperature is above 55 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, if you're in a warm climate, that may work fine all winter long. The microbes are active. It's above 55 Fahrenheit. Everything works. But if you're in a cold climate like I am, a zone 5, when I put sulfur on the soil in the fall, it just sits there till spring. Nothing happens until the following summer. So we need about six months for this to happen during the warm weather. So you might as well spread it in spring. There's no point in putting it on in the fall. Now, how do you put it in the soil? Do you layer it on like a mulch or sprinkle it around or dig it in? Well, remember, the microbes have to be there. They have to act on the sulfur. So we have to get it in the soil. Now, in a vegetable garden, the best thing to do is to dig it right in. If it's a permanent planting, you're trying to reduce the soil pH. Spread it on the top and then scratch it into the top inch or two. We have to get it in the soil. The other reason is that sulfur is a very fine powder, and if you just sprinkle it around, it's likely that the wind will blow it away. So put it on the soil, get it into the soil. Now the microbes can act on it. What form of sulfur should you buy? And there are a variety of choices here. So the two common ones is powdered sulfur and pelletized sulfur. Now, I recommend you use powdered sulfur, mostly because of cost. It's a yellow powder. You can spread it around. I mean, you don't want to breathe a whole pile of it in, but it's not really going to harm you. It's a very safe chemical, very inert. It doesn't do anything. It does have a bit of odor, but not too bad. So that's what I would recommend. For commercial farming operations, they now make pelletized sulfur. They squeeze it down into a little pellet so it's not so dusty, and it's a little easier to apply. The problem is that it takes time for that pellet to now break apart. And so it slows down the process and it's more expensive to buy the pellets. But either of those products will work just fine. Now, if you're going to buy some of this, try to get it from a feed store or a place that sells it in larger bags. It's relatively inexpensive. Now I looked up powdered sulfur. Now this comes in 50 pound bags and it's pure sulfur. It's 100% sulfur. And that bag costs about $30. So it's a dollar a pound. Now, the other alternative is you could go down to your nursery or your home hardware store and buy one of these little bags. And I looked up one of these products too. I found this online, the Espoma Organic Acidifier. Now, it's available in 30-pound bags too, but it's only 30% sulfur. The other 70% is just some sort of inert material that's of no value to you. And the price is a lot more expensive. When you actually calculate the cost per pound of sulfur, it worked out to $18 a pound compared to $1 a pound. So don't buy the fancy brands. Go and find some pure agricultural sulfur and it's very inexpensive. Now how long does it take to react in soil? Well it depends on a lot of things. How many microbes you have in the soil, the soil temperature, how well it's mixed in the soil and so on. But it is a slow reaction. You'll start seeing a drop in pH after about three months but it can take a full 12 months to see the full drop the full conversion of that sulfur to sulfate. It's a slow process, so plan for that. How much do you have to add? Well, there's three questions you have to ask yourself. What is your starting pH? The higher your pH, the more you're going to have to add to make it acidic. What is your target pH? Are you trying to go from 7.5 to 6.5? Or are you trying to go from 7.5 all the way down to 4.5, which is what azaleas and blueberries like? So what is your target pH? And the third thing that's important is the type of soil you have. It turns out that organic matter and clay act as buffers. And we talked about this a little bit already. What that means is they stabilize pH. They make the soil stubborn. They turn it into soil that doesn't want to change pH, even when you put some sulfur on it. That's what buffering is. They slow down the reaction and soil with a lot of organic matter and or clay requires more sulfur to drop the pH of your soil. So the soil type is important. 
Now here's a chart with some value and you can see different starting points, different ending points, and different types of soil. And the chart tells you how many pounds of sulfur you need for every 1,000 square feet. And when I say one pound of sulfur, I mean pure sulfur. If you end up buying a product that is only partially sulfur, you'll have to add more of it to compensate. If you have to add a lot of sulfur to get to the pH you want, it's a good idea to add a little bit at a time. Add some every four months or so. Spread it out over the next year. So I've given you a lot of information, so let's summarize. If you want to drop the pH in your soil, make sure you really need to do that. I strongly recommend you grow things that grow in your soil and don't bother dropping pH. If you need to drop the pH, use sulfur as the main ingredient to do that. If you just want small drops in pH and you're fertilizing, you can use ammonium sulfate fertilizer and that will give you a bit of drop in pH. But the thing that works best is sulfur. If you want to learn more about soil, have a look at my book, Soil Science for Gardeners. And if you want to learn more about soil myths, have a look at this video right here. Happy gardening.